Divinity Original Sin is the first game I've covered in this series on the history of isometric CRPGs where I can say I not only enjoyed the combat, but found it the best part of the game. For the first time I looked forward to major encounters like boss battles, and I rarely found fights a chore or a distraction to be done away with as quickly as possible. Time permitting, I would quite happily play the entire game again on a harder difficulty, because I learned a lot during my first playthrough and I want the chance to put those lessons into practice. This was partly to be expected, it would be a big letdown if combat hadn't improved from the second edition Dungeons and Dragons rule set that was used for most of those old CRPGs. Due to my lack of experience with Dungeons and Dragons when I went into those, I spent most of my time with the likes of Baldur's Gate and Planescape Torment, just trying to learn the rules and get to the stage where the intricacies of Thaco didn't take too much away from exploring the worlds and stories on offer. And the less said about whatever the early Fallout games were trying to do combat-wise, the better. Frankly, I was satisfied with understanding the combat well enough that I could ignore it, and then focus on the story which I consider the prime appeal of a good CRPG. Unfortunately, while Divinity Original Sin nails the combat part, it fails to offer a compelling story or many interesting characters. The main narrative is bland, save the universe, chosen one, all the cliches in one package nonsense, the writing swings awkwardly between silly and serious and doesn't do either especially well, the characters have less personality than people who base their identities on what fandoms they belong to, and world building is largely non-existent. Lest I sound overly critical, I do think Original Sin is a good game. The way you can interact with the environment provides for creativity in both puzzle solving and combat, and even though the writing was unremarkable in nearly every way, there were just enough nice moments to keep me pushing on. Ultimately, the 80 hours I spent with Original Sin flew by fairly quickly and I enjoyed the experience. As so often seems to be the case, the lack of a compelling main story can often be explained with a closer look at the development of the game and the history of the studio. As we'll see, Larian Studios doesn't have a great track record when it comes to prioritising stories in its games. Larian Studios was founded by Sven Vinka in 1996, and frankly it's a miracle that it survived the 18 years until the release of Divinity Original Sin. In the early days, Larian employees were on weekly contracts. Every Friday afternoon they anxiously waited at their desks to see if they had a contract for the next week, or if they would be out of a job before the start of the weekend. Vinka sometimes paid employee wages himself, and this once left him so low on money he had to call his partner from a gas station because he couldn't pay for the fuel he just put in his car. In those early days, Larian worked simultaneously on two projects, The Lady, the Mage and the Knight, a fantasy RPG with three playable protagonists, and LED Wars, an RTS game that looked very much like Command and Conquer. LED Wars was developed in just five months and published in 1997, although I can't find much information about it beyond a few screenshots. The Lady, the Mage and the Knight was cancelled. Larian then took on work for higher projects like educational games just to get some money flowing in. Larian Studios returned to RPGs with Divine Divinity, which incorporated parts of The Lady, the Mage and the Knight, and this one was actually finished and released in 2002. Larian described Divine Divinity as a cross between Baldur's Gate and Diablo, although I see it as much closer to the latter. As discussed in my video on the death and return of isometric CRPGs, there was a period in the late 90s and early 2000s when publishers were obsessed with Diablo clones, and Larian Studios admits that Divine Divinity was an attempt to cash in on that trend. The combat system became a hack and slash because that was the rage back then. So and this was an easy one to sell to a publisher. If it was a hack and slash game with something unique, word was you could make money. In interviews, the developers emphasised the focus on story in Divine Divinity, and while there's probably a lot more writing in Divine Divinity than in Diablo, it's also true that the main story was hashed out in a couple of days, and its main selling point was clearly the slasher, dungeon crawler combat, not the generic writing. The story really came in as an afterthought. We made it in three days, that was the story, because we were really focused on the systems, on building the world, and giving you a good time. Divine Divinity did fairly well, both critically and commercially, however Larian Studios initially thought the game had failed, because the studio itself made so little money from the project. The publisher, a German company called CDV Software Entertainment, received a nice chunk of change from sales, but little of that money flowed through to the developer, and as such Larian had to lay off a lot of employees. Vinka was understandably upset at not profiting from a successful project, and decided to go the self-publishing route. It was only when Larian started negotiating with distributors for the sequel Beyond Divinity that they realised how well Divine Divinity had performed. 
distributors practically queued up to do deals with Larian because the first game would perform nicely for them. Even more so than with the first game, the sequel Beyond Divinity was very much done for the cash. It was rushed out and didn't live up to Larian's expectations. There were a lot of bugs and in the frantic lead up to release, many quests had to be cut or trimmed down beyond all recognition. One quest changed from a massive multi-hour dungeon crawl to just going into the next room to pick up an item. It got cut so much that in the beginning of the dungeon, there was simply a table with an imp there saying, I need mushroom X. And you would go to the next room, the mushroom would be there, you picked it up and you brought it back to the table. So this took like 20 seconds. But this was an entire dungeon and an entire story that got cut. Another trend in the early 2000s, and again I discuss it in that Death and Return video, was the move to 3D RPGs, and Larian knew it had to follow suit in order to stay relevant. Fortunately, Larian had some experience with 3D games thanks to all its work on those children's entertainment projects it had knocked out on the side. Larian's next project, Divinity 2 Ego Draconis, was a 3D RPG. Divinity 2, which released on Xbox 360 in addition to PC, was a complete mess on release. As such, it wasn't well received with either critics or fans. To be fair to Larian, Divinity 2 was an ambitious game for such a small studio. Making a 3D RPG was taxing enough, but Larian really went all out by giving players the ability to fly around the world on a dragon. This added a whole heap of new problems, including figuring out dragon flight and combat, performance stability when moving around the world fast, and having there be something for the player to do regardless of where they happen to park their dragon. The failure of Divinity 2 once again left Larian Studios in a difficult spot. Larian took on a lot of debt during production of Divinity 2, which is common in game development. However, repayment of the debt was based on sales assumptions that Divinity 2 didn't meet. Larian once again did work for higher jobs to pay the bills. Vinka had become increasingly concerned about Larian's relationship with its own fans, and was worried that Larian was getting a reputation for releasing broken products. Therefore, instead of moving on to a new project immediately, Larian set about fixing Divinity 2. In 2011, Larian released Divinity 2 The Dragon Knight Saga, which was essentially a working version of Divinity 2 with the expansion included. This version was much better received by both critics and fans, and partially repaired the reputational damage done on the initial release. Fixing Divinity 2 was a good start, however Vinka knew that going forward something had to change for the studio. Larian's previous games all followed a similar pattern, namely starting with lofty ambitions but then stripping features late on, and releasing in a broken state due to publisher demands, or in one case a simple need to bring in cash quickly. Rightly or wrongly, Larian felt that it had been screwed over by publishers at every turn, and was determined to self-publish going forward. Larian made a commitment. No more broken games. Well, within reason anyway. Massive RPGs are always going to have issues. I think Larian just wanted to get to the stage where the main discussion point on release was the quality of the game itself, and not how broken it was. Larian started work on two projects, a title based on the Dragonflight system created for Divinity 2 that would become known as Divinity Dragon Commander, and an RPG called Divinity Eyes of the Child, which would come to be known as Divinity Original Sin. The idea was for one project to be a smaller and cheaper game that wouldn't take too long to make, and could be released as soon as possible to bring in money that is then used to finance the larger title that would take more time to bring to fruition. It may surprise you to learn that the smaller title was Divinity Original Sin, with Dragon Commander being seen as the main release that Larian was banking its future on. Original Sin, or Eyes of the Child as it was then known, would have been a short game and the plan was to release it on Xbox Arcade for around $20. This version of Original Sin would have had real-time combat and been based on an abducted child whose paintings became reality. However, during development it became clear that the team had something special on its hands with the RPG, and decided to push forward the release of Dragon Commander to focus on Original Sin. Larian thought the abducted child story was too small in scale for a large RPG and switched things up to a more traditional save the world hero's journey. Of course, it's all well and good having lofty goals like um, releasing games that actually work, it's quite another to raise the money to fund such a lengthy development time. For whatever reason, I always associated Original Sin with Kickstarter, and assumed the crowdfunding campaign on the website had been a significant factor in funding the project, however that wasn't really the case. In fact, Larian Studios had already exhausted nearly every major source of funding by this point, and Kickstarter was a relatively late attempt to raise more money. In other words, Kickstarter didn't so much kickstart the project as kick it over the finish line. 
Initially, Larian Studios raised money through investors. The company used what's known as a Special Purpose Vehicle, or SPV, in which the intellectual property for the game was placed in a new company that was to be 51% owned by Larian and 49% by outside investors. That SPV then contracted with Larian to make the game. Importantly, the subsidiary only held the IP to this specific game, not Original Sin or Divinity more broadly, so Larian didn't then lose out when it came to making the sequel. In addition to investors, Larian took on bank loans, although at that point there were not many Belgian banks prepared to lend to them. Larian also, uh, what's the best way to put this? Larian borrowed money from the Belgian government by being somewhat flexible in paying over VAT collected on sales, and it ended up getting blacklisted by the government. While Vinka doesn't go into too much detail here, understandably, this situation was likely incredibly serious. A lot of corporate bankruptcies are initiated by tax authorities. Whereas a bank or other debtor may agree to accept a few cents on the dollar or euro in this case because they see no alternative, the tax authorities are often preferential creditors and will push for bankruptcy to get the best return on behalf of the taxpayer. Larian Studios also released Original Sin into the still relatively new early access program on Steam, which raised money, and perhaps more importantly built relationships between Larian and the player base, which then meant of course Larian could fix bugs before the official release. And yeah, then there's the Kickstarter, which raised just shy of $1 million from a goal of $400,000. Unlike many Kickstarter projects, Original Sin was quite far along already, and the money was there to flesh out the world with more content and to polish the game before release. And boy did that release go well. Original Sin received critical acclaim and commercial success on a scale unlike anything Larian had seen before, and there was no publisher to take all the money. Critics labelled Original Sin as a modern day Baldur's Gate, which with Larian Studios now making Baldur's Gate 3 does seem incredibly appropriate. According to Vinka, Larian never saw Divinity Original Sin as a modern day Baldur's Gate and was surprised and pleased when that label was placed on the game. As we'll see, I don't think the Baldur's Gate comparisons are really on point, although given that isometric CRPGs had basically been dead for a decade when this came out, I can certainly understand why people would rush to put that label on the first thing that came close. Shadowrun Returns probably doesn't count because that was sci-fi instead of fantasy. One irrelevant but interesting point Vinka mentioned in a presentation to game developers was how useless online advertising turned out to be. Larian paid about $20,000 for full-page takeovers of popular PC gaming websites, and yet it only generated 6,000 clicks. If well-reviewed games like Original Sin can't get clicks, it makes me wonder how much big publishers are spending desperately trying to get people to play their bad games. Despite Larian's efforts, there were plenty of bugs on final release, however due to the success of the game, Larian was able to spend the time fixing them, while working on a major update to the game called the Enhanced Edition, which was delivered free to all owners of the base game. In total, the Enhanced Edition contained over 13,000 changes, some of them likely so minor no one has noticed them, but some of them fairly major. Controller support and split screen modes were added, likely in preparation for the console ports that came in 2015 for PS4 and Xbox One. The ability to move the camera a full 360 degrees was included, before the camera could only be moved about 120 degrees. Voiceovers were added for all the dialogue, which must have been incredibly expensive but certainly helped boost the production values. The difficulty settings were renamed and rejigged so that enemies were smarter on the harder settings and there was a permadeath option. New combat choices like wands and grenades plus the ability to dual wield weapons were added, plus a few new creature types like poison slugs and bolt stricken zombies. Slightly more controversially, some of these skills were removed or tweaked. While new skills were also added, the overall total went down from 139 to 128. The skill system was also altered slightly to fit in a tier system of novice, adept and master. Items in the economy as a whole were rebalanced, as was the late game in an effort to make it slightly harder. There were also story tweaks, companion banter and a few new areas such as the short epilogue which is essentially just a hero's walk where you can say goodbye to your companions. Players can still play the original version on PC, although I played the enhanced edition for the purposes of this video. Even in the enhanced edition, six years after the release of the original, there are still bugs, although they are more like minor niggles than anything especially game breaking. For example, in combat the game would often pause during an enemy's turn as if that enemy was thinking really hard about its next move, and then eventually the game gives up and moves on to the next character. It's annoying, but not a huge deal, especially when you consider how engaging the combat is overall. Much to my surprise, and probably yours if you follow this channel, the combat is my favourite part of the game, even though it commits the original sin of being turn-based. 
Divinity Original Sin isn't the first turn-based game I've played in this series on isometric CRPGs. The first two Fallout games and the three Shadowrun games were all turn-based as well, however they are short games by the standards of CRPGs, and also sci-fi, although that's probably just a coincidence. I probably should have played Arcanum as a turn-based game because the difficulty does seem tuned around that, however the game presented real-time combat as the default due to publisher pressure, which is something I discussed in my video on that game. The first and probably most important thing Original Sin gets right is having nearly every combat encounter feel unique and like a separate puzzle. My dislike of turn-based combat in RPGs is more due to the reliance on grinding and fighting the same encounters over and over again. Games like Baldur's Gate can almost be played in a turn-based fashion if you so desire. Behind the scenes it's all just dice rolls. With careful utilisation of the pause button you can kind of recreate a turn-based combat feel. However, that would be tedious as hell because the frequency of enemy encounters clearly isn't designed for each one to be slowed down to that extent. Most players, obviously not all, but most, would get bored stiff playing Baldur's Gate in a turn-based fashion, because so many of the fights are the same. Slowing things down that much would be a nightmare and turn an 80-hour game into a 200-hour one. The pacing and repetition of the combat encounters is predicated on the assumption that they take place in real time with the odd tactical pause. Original Sin avoids this problem by drastically cutting down on the number of enemy encounters and making each one more meaningful. Nearly every fight is different from what you've seen before and either requires or encourages variations in tactics. There are obvious changes like new enemy types or new mixtures of enemies, so a group of typical human enemies with swords and bows might next time be accompanied by a couple of magic users or even creatures like spiders. More subtle changes are still important. One battle may take place in a relatively empty environment, while the next could contain hazards to avoid or use to your advantage. Something as simple as a puddle of water can completely change the battle if you or the enemy has the ability to deal electrical damage. Your fire attack becomes a lot more potent if there's a poison barrel that can be blown open first to amplify the fire damage. Extreme weather conditions might mean you have less action points per turn in the desert, or you're at risk of slipping up every time you move on ice in the snowy region of Hyberheim. This variety means each encounter can feel like a puzzle with multiple solutions. To be fair, you could say something similar for real-time CRPGs too. Baldur's Gate had creative ways to fight, it was just harder to focus on combat as a puzzle when everything changed so fast around you. For example, on the rare times I tried to get clever with AoE spells, I would either miss everyone or hit friendlies, because everyone moves around so fast. It's like trying to do a crossword puzzle with the boxes moving all the time. Instead of solving a puzzle, I found myself using much the same tactics in every battle, and only stopping to think when those choices failed. Original Sin is different. Okay, I still had favourite skills that I fell back on. For most of my playthrough I only had one melee character, and I started each fight by having her rage, encourage others, switch stance, and then use a battering ram ability to get into the heat of combat. It was incredibly effective. My ranger often started a fight by using his expert marksman abilities that hit multiple enemies because, well, that seemed like a sensible thing to do at the start of a fight when enemies were often grouped together. However, each combat encounter offers so many options and ways to approach it that you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't mix things up a bit. Plus, with clear hit zones on the screen, I could finally use AoE attacks effectively. Original Sin doesn't necessarily have more options than the other CRPGs I've covered in this series, it just makes me more likely to use them. In the D&D based games, I rarely used rogues beyond having them spot traps and lockpick chests. I couldn't find the time or inclination to get them behind enemies for backstabs. In Original Sin I finally used rogues because when combat is turn based it can be incredibly satisfying to watch an invisible party member sneak right up to the back of the crowd and then come out of the shadows with a deadly backstab. Oh and then there's the teleport ability that you can use to not only slam enemies down from the sky but also slam them into traps you're setting up. Hell you could even teleport your own party members into or out of danger if you like. In other CRPGs the speed of combat meant I typically did the bare minimum. Maybe a few silent spells for enemy mages, and of course some elemental weaknesses are obvious and there to be exploited, but I didn't sweat the details, hence I never got especially good at those games. Original Sin made me want to sweat the details. Partly that was because fights were long, if you mess up you have to watch the consequences of that decision play out over 15 minutes before your inevitable defeat. That's bound to induce a bit of care and attention. 
In addition, though, Original Sin rewards careful planning through a detailed system of environmental reactions that go way beyond basic water puts out fire stuff. For example, fairly early on I realised that poison and fire are an explosive combination. This led to the fairly obvious tactic of blowing open a poison barrel or throwing a poison grenade at the start of a fight and then using a fire arrow or fire spell to light the poison and deal damage to every enemy in the nearby proximity. However, that fire hangs around for a while and if you're not careful you'll find your melee characters unable to close the distance to the enemy without taking a ton of damage walking through fire. Don't worry though because water gets rid of fire so a quick rain spell solves the problem. However, rain on fire creates steam clouds that block your view of the battlefield and make rangers largely useless. Of course, blocking the battlefield or obscuring certain party members could be to your advantage. Once again though, the situation can be turned around with an electrical attack that turns a steam cloud into a static cloud that stuns enemies who enter it. In other words, your early decision to release poison can have a huge knock-on effect on how the battle plays out. If you start the battle again and don't use poison, the battle could play out in an entirely different manner. And there's nothing stopping the enemy using these tricks against you. It's all very well and good casting a rain spell to increase your fire resistance, but that won't help if the enemy has a bunch of electrical attacks at its disposal. And that brings me on to resistances. Enemies are not only resistant to certain elements, they can be healed by them. You don't want to use poison against undead enemies for example unless you want to tempt them into the poison before blowing it up I suppose. At this point I should probably reiterate that I'm aware most of this isn't technically new. Many of the tactics I used in Original Sin like creating oil puddles and then setting them alight when an enemy stepped on them are options in other games I've covered in this series, I just rarely did any of that. I started this video series on isometric CRPGs nearly three years ago now. So in case you've forgotten, one of my main goals was to track my personal progress with a genre I wasn't all that familiar with, beyond the first two Fallout games. These videos are not only looking at how the games themselves change over time, but how I change playing them. With Original Sin, the most notable difference in my play style was my use of what I term unexciting spells. Spells that lower resistances or provide slight buffs to your party or nerfs to enemies. I used buffs in other CRPGs, but usually only before battle, like a quick haste and a blessing before walking into a new room, that kind of thing. I rarely stopped to recast those buffs during combat when they expired. Original Sin though had me actively excited to use non-damage dealing spells. It wasn't uncommon for two of my four party members to just hang back throwing out shields or lowering enemy resistances, and I loved doing that, especially because each fight needed a slightly different approach and thankfully you have a lot of options at your disposal. Another reason I use these unexciting spells is because Original Sin does such a good job displaying buffs and debuffs on enemies. In the older CRPGs I often found myself having to guess what each different type of visual effect around enemies represented. Confusion versus stun versus fear versus panic and that kind of thing. And then when I did figure it out I had to look at a manual to work out the exact implications. Original Sin makes status effects much easier to read and understand, which in turn means I'm much more inclined to actually apply them. Again, it's not a new thing, it's just the experience is so much smoother. The overall combat in Original Sin reminded me a bit of Thronebreaker the Witcher card game. I don't particularly like card collection games, probably because they have a lot in common with turn-based combat in RPGs. However, Thronebreaker didn't simply shove you from one card fight to the next. The exact rule sets and circumstances changed constantly and many of the battles were specifically designed as puzzles. Original Sin has a few encounters like that, for example when you're surrounded by the adorable little walking bombs and need to set off a chain reaction of explosions while staying out of harm's way. Or you can cast a rain spell to defuse the bombs, but come on, where's the fun in that? There were a few battles that felt unnecessary and repetitive, for example some of the fights against spiders in the desert region of Lasula Forest offered nothing new, likewise the snowmen in Hyberheim and maybe the undead in Sicil. Those are exceptions though and I never felt like I was grinding. Besides, even if a battle looks repetitive at first glance it could actually play out very differently thanks to what feels like incredibly aggressive RNG. The randomness can lead to a real temptation for save scumming, however I never played on the hardest difficulties here and as such I never felt particularly inclined to do this. The difference between a good battle and a bad one for me, especially early on, was more about whether I had to use any resurrection scrolls at the end to bring people back to life after battle. 
I prefer the option of, say, traveling into town, selling loot, and then traveling back to the place of my companion's grave, rather than a starting again and abusing quick saves. The RNG was especially prevalent early on when my archer still struggled to hit the proverbial barn door with the proverbial banjo from three proverbial feet. If you only have two characters and one of them misses every shot they take, you sure do feel vulnerable. Perhaps the best example of the randomness came in the very last battle against the final boss. This is a long fight, so I made a quick save about 15-20 minutes through. I was rarely saving during battles, but I think for longer ones like this it's acceptable. Immediately after the quick save, I tried to charm a couple of void demons. They had low willpower, so the odds were in my favour. However, even though all three arrows hit, the charm spell failed to take effect. Those three enemies went on to absolutely annihilate an NPC I was admittedly doing a bad job of protecting, and that meant it was game over. I loaded up from that quick save and tried the charm arrows again. This time they all worked and the rest of the fight was a complete cakewalk. The extreme results you get based on just one character's turn could really be quite jarring, such as when my party got completely wiped out at the start of a boss fight because they were all too close together. The restrictions on the number of spells you can use is perhaps a bit annoying. While it's not uncommon to have a limit on what you have equipped in your spellbook at any one time, I did find the restrictions here almost unnecessary because there aren't that many spells to begin with. For example, you can only have two master level skills for each type of magic equipped at any one time, but I think there are only about five anyway. It's not like in Baldur's Gate where there are hundreds of the damn things and you have to narrow them down to a handful. If you did have more spells at your disposal, there would need to be a corresponding increase in cooldowns or action point cost to use, but that doesn't seem an insurmountable problem. Mostly though, the only limits to how fights are going to play out are in your imagination. I just happen to have a terrible imagination. Character creation initially looked as free form as the combat. There are no fixed classes, so you can build your character however you like, with no minimums or maximums based on class. Any character can take on any skills, so if you suddenly decide you want your archer to be able to fire off spells, then you certainly can do that. But you probably shouldn't. Or at least a new player probably shouldn't. I'm not saying you can't succeed with weird and wacky builds and a team full of hybrids. No doubt people have completed Original Sin with just one character while naked and attacking with a butter knife. However, I could never escape the feeling that by far the best builds were also the simplest and most focused. The six main abilities are Strength, Intelligence, Dexterity, Constitution, Speed and Perception. Strength, Intelligence and Dexterity are the core attributes and you want to focus on one as a primary for each character. Strength is obviously for melee fighters, Intelligence for most magic users and Dexterity for archers and rogues. The other attributes are secondary abilities so maybe put some points into Constitution for your tank, Speed for your archer and Perception for your rogue, that kind of thing. Each attribute is capped at 15, although you can go over this with gear bonuses, and there are a lot of gear bonuses, so you likely will. You start with two main characters. I made one of my main characters a ranger, so he was simple enough to create, but for the other I wanted to be a battle mage. Unfortunately I couldn't make it work. Once I reached around level 8 I started ignoring the battle part and had her be a mage instead. Partly my difficulty came from spreading the attributes around too thinly, with only one new attribute point every other level, alternating between strength and intelligence was a pain, and it meant neglecting speed, which in turn meant fewer action points. Many of the best spells require most or all of your action points, so if you start a battle casting a spell, there's nothing you can do until the next round. I would then spend multiple turns just trying to get my battle mage into melee range, and half the time fights would finish by the time she had gotten into position. I also wanted to put points into constitution because without full armour your battle mage is weak, and if she does wear full armour then it takes even longer to get into the heat of the action because armour slows down your movement speed. I made a complete hash of it in other words. But the real problem for hybrid classes comes with the ability selection. Once again these abilities can easily be divided into groups of primary and secondary, or primary and don't bother really. You should focus on applicable weapon and magic abilities first and foremost, plus some defensive stuff if you have a character who will be getting down and dirty. Abilities become gradually more expensive as you level them up, so it costs 1 point to get level 1 in two-handed swords, 2 points for level 2, and so on up to level 5. A battle mage needs to spread points between a weapon skill, multiple types of magic, and defensive abilities. This proved too much, well for me anyway, and I opted to focus on the magical abilities after wasting some points on two-handed weapons. I also made a mistake around allocating my ability points to magic systems, although in this case it was only a mistake with the benefit of hindsight. 
I assumed that as were the attributes, you wouldn't want to spread your abilities too thin. I started off with points in witchcraft and pyromancy, and figured it would be best to keep focusing on those abilities. However, one huge problem early in the game in particular is that you are outnumbered all the time, and if RNG doesn't go your way, you can get torn apart before you get to move. At this stage, having low level ability in lots of different magic types is actually preferable to focusing on one or two, because at level one in each magic type you can conjure spirits to fight for you, which is incredibly useful for crowd control. There are long cooldowns, but if you plan properly you can summon an earth elemental, then a fire elemental once that one has been defeated and so on. Even characters that don't have magical talent can do this, so you might want your archer to do a bit of summoning as well, just to keep enemies from attacking the main characters. I don't think this mistake was entirely on me. I wasn't to know that being outnumbered would be such a big problem early on, nor that all characters would be able to summon regardless of intelligence. Still, my failed hybrid battle mage is one of the reasons I wouldn't mind playing Original Sin again. I reckon I could now create a good battle mage, and there's potential for some really fun mage rogue hybrids in here as well. Even though I messed up early point distribution, I never did a full respec. I wanted to, but by the time I unlocked the person who did that, it proved too expensive. Not in terms of the gold cost to reallocate points, but because you lose all the spells you previously had memorised and have to buy them all again. At a push, I might have been able to raise the money to get them, but frankly I just couldn't be bothered. The other abilities affect soft skills like bartering, charisma and crafting. Most of these can be ignored, although Lore Master is useful because it lets you identify enemy weaknesses and identify rare items. However, you don't need to go crazy here. Lots of items include buffs for those abilities, so if you need a higher Lore Master skill to identify items, you can just stick on the appropriate ring or amulet for a bit. I had a ring I kept popping on and off whenever I needed to identify level 5 gear, and if I was feeling especially stingy I could equip gear with bartering attributes before buying and selling, although that was usually a bit too much micromanagement for my taste. There's also a list of talents that range from essential to useless and from interesting to dull. I tried to be braver than usual and take a few risks. For example, I made one character a glass cannon, which halved his health points in exchange for extra action points. The no-brainer talents are things like attacks of opportunity for melee fighters, arrow recovery for archers, and longer distance on spells for mages. You then get random things like switching poison and health potions around so that poison essentially heals you but health potions will hurt you, doing extra damage with attacks depending on the type of ground you're standing on, or even healing you if you happen to be standing on blood. A minor but surprising limitation in character creation is that you can only play as humans, even though the world has other races like orcs, imps and the like. From what I've seen of the sequel, it more than makes up for this omission. Of course, I do have my fair share of issues with the combat in Original Sin. The main one is the difficulty curve, which is essentially backwards. It starts too hard and ends too easy. As someone with limited experience in strategy games, I started off on classic difficulty, which is essentially normal, and while I was able to win most battles early on, just, I often had to resurrect at least one companion at the end, and so between battles I had to head back to town to sell gear and buy more supplies, mainly resurrection scrolls. Couple this with feeling increasingly uncomfortable with my choice to create a battle mage, and I was really struggling. My archer was terrible and my battle mage was often useless. I had a rogue in my party who could do a lot of damage but was also prone to being targeted by enemies and that often meant he was the first one killed. These were definitely problems I could have solved myself with either a little more forethought or hindsight, and by itself this is a criticism of me, not the game. However, given that the game then gets so much easier near the end, I think there is a clear difficulty balancing issue. I went from turning the difficulty down to Explorer for a bit just to make it out of Psyseal, which was really starting to bore me after 25 hours, to wanting to turn it up to Tactician by the end because every fight was a cakewalk. The minor issue that is actually infuriating is how you can click the mouse button to initiate an attack but instead have your character walk over and stand next to the enemy. What happens, I think, is that the enemy animations, which sometimes see them sway from side to side, mean you can have the mouse cursor lined up on them and then when you click the enemy is moved enough that it looks like you're trying to click the ground next to them. This often happened with my archer, who of course is the last person I wanted to send into the middle of battle. You can cancel movements with a right click if you're quick, but by that point you may have already spent too many action points and wasted your turn. There really needs to be the option to pause the game after combat is finished or have all status effects instantly disappear. A couple of my characters died because they kept taking poison or fire damage after the fight and I wasn't able to heal them quickly enough. 
when you're short on resurrection scrolls, there's little more frustrating than having a character die while you're celebrating from winning a hard fight. The enemy AI can be pretty stupid. They often walk from A to B and then back to A again in one turn, or in more extreme cases, large bosses like Bracchus Rex destroy half their minions while attacking you. Perhaps this is a commentary on how little rulers care about their subjects. Another combat weakness is the focus on a mysterious metal called Tenebrium, which is a big deal story-wise in the second half of the game, but hard to find a good use for in combat, at least in my experience. There is one particular enemy that is weak to it, however you can easily avoid them for a bit until you get a spell that lets you kill them in one go. To make effective use of Tenebrium weapons you need to invest in Tenebrium as a separate skill, and to add Tenebrium to your existing weapons, which is probably what you want to do instead of buying specific Tenebrium ones, you'll need good crafting, which is another skill you then need to invest in. I just couldn't see the point, but on Tactician it might be necessary. On Normal I kept waiting for it to become a big deal and it never did. As an aside, crafting can be a huge part of the game if you want it to be, but I ignored it. With careful trading I had enough money to buy what I needed, and frankly crafting was more extra steps than I cared to bother with. I like the concept though. You can either find recipes or take a guess by using a bit of common sense. I might have been more inclined to get into crafting if the inventory screens hadn't been so horrendous. Fair play, you can carry a lot of stuff. However, there's also a lot of junk and you have to keep resorting everything because the inventory screens don't remember how you want things displayed. Despite these criticisms, I enjoyed the combat a lot. And if it weren't for the overall length of the game and that slow start in Sisil, I would quite like to replay the whole thing on Tactician difficulty. With the Dungeons and Dragons games, I often felt out of my depth because I was. I had no D&D experience and what I did learn didn't exactly inspire me to learn more. In one of my videos, I think it was the Baldur's Gate 2 one, I specifically asked for recommendations on videos and resources to help me improve, because I didn't know where to go next. That's absolutely not the case here. If I were to play again on a harder difficulty, I know how I'd go about doing it. I'd correct mistakes I made the first time around, and try to make the most of every opportunity provided to me. That's a big difference from being thrown in at the deep end and expected to consult a 300 page rulebook if I ever had any questions, and that's assuming I could figure out what questions to ask. There's a second, less pleasant reason why I'm happy to rate combat as unequivocally the best part of Original Sin, and that's because the other major aspects of the game such as quest design and story are so disappointing. With regards to quest design there are two major problems. One, too many of the quests aren't properly integrated into the game, so there are no consequences for what should be major decisions. And two, despite a few quests having creative solutions, you typically have little real freedom in how and when you go about solving the quests. As discussed earlier, one of the major reasons for raising money via Kickstarter was to fill the world with more things to do. For the most part this worked out fine. Having small quests pop up as you explore the forest does make the world feel a little more alive, so mission accomplished. Quests like finding the long lost cat of a dead sailor don't have long term consequences that need to be integrated into the main story, they're just fun side activities. However there are far too many quests that while technically optional should have a huge impact on the world and yet they are kept entirely separate. This makes the world feel somewhat sterile. You can almost tell which quests were hurriedly outsourced with all that kickstarter money. The two most egregious examples popped up in Hunter's Edge, and they encapsulate the frustrating rigidity of Original Sin when it comes to storytelling and mission structure. Hunter's Edge is the town run by a group of orcs in an awkward alliance with some equally nasty humans. Most former residents of the town have been killed or captured, although a few are in hiding. The residents face a grim fate if caught. There's a monster on the upper floor of the inn, prisoners are sent up there and never heard from again, well unless you count their blood curdling screams as they are brutally murdered. The monster committing these murders is Norik, the son of the orc leader Grutilda. Norik is also linked to a companion quest for Medora. Medora used to be a source hunter here in Hunter's Edge. When orcs attacked the town she was left for dead in a mass grave and only survived because she was able to heal herself with a special bloodstone. Medora recognises Norik as one of the murderous orcs who invaded the town, killed her friends and nearly killed her. Her companion quest is to essentially get her revenge against Norik. But then you speak to Norik. He's a kid. His mother told him the prisoners wanted to play with him and that their idea of a fun time meant having their limbs ripped off. If they screamed it just meant they were having fun and if they suddenly stopped making noise it just meant they were sleeping. Norik has no idea he's been killing people and he's a victim of his mother's lies. 
Norik's story is effectively a heartbreaking tale of child abuse. However, before you can decide what to do about this poor kid, Medora chips in to say that she can't get over what Norik did to her friends and therefore she must kill him. At least that's what happened in my playthrough. Medora can forgive Norik, however, it's dependent on a couple of factors. First, your two protagonists must have the forgiving personality trait, which influences Medora slightly, although you must also specifically teach her to be tolerant. The dialogue here is a bit weird. I seem to pass the first check because my characters were forgiving, and it sounded like Medora was going to forgive Norik, but then she instantly transitions to, sorry I'm going to have to kill this kid anyway, and we're all forced to fight him to the death. I looked into this a bit because I was sure most of my conversations with Medora had preached forgiveness. While I'm not 100% certain, it looks like I didn't get enough forgiveness conversation points or whatever, simply because I didn't have Medora in my party early enough, and therefore I missed some of the conversations which would have led her down the right path. Even with the hidden conversation checks, there should have been more flexibility here, especially because my characters had the forgiving trait themselves. Perhaps Medora should tell the group she wants to kill Norik for personal reasons, and we get the chance to tell her that's unacceptable. We could have the option to let her kill Norik without joining in, or letting her kill him herself but then kicking her from the group, or even fighting her to the death in Norik's defence. Instead, if Medora decides not to forgive Norik, you have absolutely no choice but to join in and kill him. However, that whole mess isn't actually my main problem with this quest. The big problem is with the consequences for killing Norik, or the complete lack thereof really. Grutilda, who is just in the room downstairs, never finds out that you killed her son. You can't tell her you killed him, or confront her about her treatment of him in any way. When you speak to other humans and orcs, they mention the brutal orc on the upper floor, but you can't tell them that you've met him and killed him. The entire interaction from meeting Norik to killing him is completely ignored by the game, and it makes the whole thing feel so incredibly lifeless. And while we're here, let's look at a similar situation where basically the same thing happens. Jarl is keeping prisoners in the basement and torturing them for information on where the remaining townsfolk are hiding. You can blag your way down there if you promise to extract information from the prisoners. I went down to the prison and promptly killed all Jarl's guards and helped the prisoners escape. Remember, this prison is just in the basement of the headquarters, directly below where Jarl is sitting. There's a guard right by the entrance, but he never goes down to check or notices that all his friends are dead. You never face any consequences for killing all the guards, and shortly after this you can team up with them to fight the orcs. It's this sort of thing that makes the whole world feel sterile. Those were some of the more egregious examples, but similar situations pop up throughout the entire game. For example, the town of Silverglen is run by a guy called Lawrence, who asks you to kill a goblin called Drexus. However, simultaneously you'll likely get a quest from Nadia, who blames Lawrence for the death of her husband and asks you to help prove his guilt. Sure enough, you can find evidence that shows Lawrence is not only responsible for the death of Nadia's husband, but also many others because he didn't care about the risks associated with sending workers into the mines to dig for Tenebrium. If you hand over the evidence, Nadia rallies the support of the townsfolk and they kill Lawrence. First of all, it's a bit annoying that the only choices here are to let Lawrence leave town or to let the mob kill him. It would be nice if prison was an option. Hell, maybe even have an actual trial if you want to get all soft and liberal about it. The really annoying bit though is what happens with the quest to kill Drexis for Lawrence. When you find Drexis, you can tell him Lawrence sent you to kill him, but you can't mention the minor detail that Lawrence is already dead. You end up fighting Drexis and getting his head as requested, but without anyone to give the head to, the quest just remains incomplete in your quest log for the rest of the game. Ideally, this quest would have had an option to maybe work for Drexis and resolve it another way. At the bare minimum, the quest should have been marked as incomplete or failed, just so it doesn't stay in the quest log for another 40 hours in my case. Original Sin often feels frustratingly inflexible, like when you talk to Alfie, a pack animal, who mentions that his masters work him too hard. You help the masters out by escorting them safely to town, but at no point can you tell them to go easy on Alfie. The game also doesn't account for conversations you might not have had. For example, I would sometimes try to get the edge in battle by attacking first and not bothering with preliminary conversations and bouts of exposition. The game actively encourages this and it's a good battle tactic. However, NPCs always assume you did have those conversations and they reference things you never said or heard. Oh, and I nearly forgot the random slaves you meet, which led to one of the most notable WTF moments I've had in a long while. While exploring the Phantom Forest, I bumped into a troll having an argument with a slave master. Unsurprisingly, the troll was demanding a toll to cross the bridge, and while the slave master was perfectly prepared to pay the toll for himself, he didn't think he should have to pay a toll for the slaves, who he considered property, not people. 
The good news is that you can fight the slave master and free the slaves. The bad news is that you do this not because you have an objection to someone owning slaves, but because you think the troll is right that the slave master should pay a fee for the slaves too. Like talk about completely and utterly missing the point. This is the sort of response I'd expect from an American Democrat, and I wonder whether Hillary Clinton was the quest designer here. She would totally claim a moral victory for making sure a slave master pay the appropriate taxes on their slaves instead of, you know, actually worrying about their being slaves in the first place. And before anyone well actuallys me, yes you are technically pretending to be a member of the same group the slave master is a part of, but given that you can kill him and many others you meet and suffer no consequences, you should probably be able to question the whole keeping people with slaves thing. It's not like this would have needed much extra work, you can already end this quest by killing the slave master and freeing the slaves. I just wanted that to be the reason I had the fight, not because I felt the troll was right to demand a fee for the slaves as well. The other major issue I had with Original Sin's quests was how little freedom you have in completing them. Dialogue options are rarely a part of quest design, so don't expect to find many charisma options or anything like that. Instead, for the vast majority of quests, you just sort of stumble into the correct place without much thought. I'm sure this will be a controversial opinion because yes, some quests actually offer an extreme amount of player freedom, and I expect it's those quests that people remember. For example, let's look at Hunter's Edge again. The town is controlled by orcs led by Grutilda, and there's a tense ceasefire with the local group of humans led by Jarl. Ultimately, both groups are your enemy, however, taking them on all in direct combat will be nigh on impossible. You can pit the two groups against each other by finding evidence that an orc killed Garrick, one of Jarl's men, during the theft of some valuable bloodstones. That's a nice option to have to change the nature of an otherwise challenging quest. However, with a bit of careful investigation, you can tip the scales even more in your favour. If you talk to the local barkeep, he mentions that the orcs drank his entire supply of whiskey. They can't get enough of the stuff. There's no more whiskey in town, but you can find a recipe book and craft your own. And it's not just a case of shoving a few ingredients in a pot. You have to fill a bucket with water, grind the barley, mix it with water, and turn that into a spirit. When that's all done, you need to age the whiskey by 30 years, which can be done quickly by taking it to zigzags at the end of time. When all that's done, you give the whiskey to the barkeep, who promptly serves the orcs, ensuring that they are all drunk when the time comes to fight. On a smaller scale, early on you're given a will and asked to pass it on to the beneficiary without looking at it. You can go ahead and do that if you like, or you can open the letter and combine ink with a quill to make alterations to the will, naming yourself as beneficiary and claiming the estate. Similarly, you can get the attention of the King of the Rats in Hunter's Edge by combining poison with cheese to kill his minions. In Hyberheim, if you're slipping on ice a lot, you can attach nails to your boots to grip the ice, which is frankly genius. Unfortunately, I found quests like this to be the exception, not the rule. I think the problem comes from a good place, though. Larian desperately wanted to avoid handholding. They mentioned this multiple times in interviews. The devs wanted players to have to think for themselves, and all that other lovely stuff that sounds so great on paper but is often a nightmare to put into practice. Strangely, despite the effort to remove handholding, I often found the process of completing quests to be incredibly rigid and mindless. Things look promising at first. The journal doesn't spell anything out for you, and there are only ever a few waypoints on the map. You're effectively dumped into a new town and told to solve a murder. It's a good start. I explored the town of Sysil and picked up a bunch of side quests, but at some point I seemed to have exhausted everything I could do there and needed to head beyond the town walls. And this was when the main problem became apparent, the map design. Here's how you complete quests in Original Sin. You walk around and uncover the map. If you come across enemies of your own level, then you fight them and carry on. If the enemies are a higher level, then you go a slightly different direction until the enemies are at your level. There's no hand-holding as we recognise it today, you aren't heading in the direction of waypoint markers or following arrows, but you kind of are. You're certainly not thinking about where you're going. The major areas such as Lucella Forest and the outskirts of Sysil have fixed paths that you follow until you get to a destination, then you head back to the start and take a different path. It's a hell of a lot more linear than it looks at first glance. Let's look at Sysil for a good example of how this works. There are a few major paths out of the city, so you seemingly have a lot of choice for where to go once you've finished up in town. Except if you rock up at the gates, the guards strongly hint that you might want to go away and level up a bit first. They will open the door if you insist, but that's making life hard on yourself. There is one route out of the city that is already open, so of course you go that way first. This just so happens to take you down a path with enemies that are about your level, and you'll complete or progress some of the quests you have in your journal. 
Once you've done this, you've probably leveled up some more and gotten a bunch of gear, so you head back to town to sell everything. And when you're ready to head back out again, you'll find the guards at one of the gates will now happily open it for you because you're the right level. And that's basically all you do in Sisil. You walk down the paths you're supposed to walk down at the time you're supposed to walk down them. I did a search online and there are maps showing you the specific routes to take and exactly what level you should be when you take them. In fact, despite the supposed lack of handholding, some NPCs tell you which are the most dangerous regions around Sisil, just in case you missed all the hints about not being a high enough level. This may not be the type of handholding we are used to, but it is still handholding, and attempts to figure out quests on your own intuition likely won't get you very far because you can't complete quests until the game decides the time is right unless you want to fight through really high level enemies. I remember trying to work on a quest involving a ghost in a lighthouse, and being a little OCD, I wanted to completely clear it from my journal before moving on. However, you're not given any information to go on, so you just keep following the path until you find the right people to talk to, and eventually you stumble upon another ghost that you need to speak to. In terms of solving quests, Original Sin often feels more like Diablo than Baldur's Gate. You move down all the paths until you find the right thing, and then you move on. Fortunately, there are quests where you genuinely need to think of it, thanks to puzzles that show off the interactive environments and cool abilities such as the teleportation pyramids. Those teleportation pyramids are especially flexible. You have two pyramids, and using one teleports you, and your team if you're connected, to the other one. A basic technique is to throw one of the pyramids to a previously inaccessible area, and then teleport over to it to get loot or find a secret entrance. Later on, I started using them when only one character was capable of getting past an obstacle. For example, I needed to get past a group of invincible death knights, so I had one character take a pyramid, go invisible, and sneak to the next room before having the rest of the group teleport over to him. Or when I was following a trail of footprints to make it across a trapped floor. Only one person had the perception score required to see the footprints, and the others had a tendency to wander off course and get themselves killed. It was far easier to have one person solve the puzzle and then teleport the rest over to him. This puzzle, like many others, has multiple solutions. If you don't have a high enough perception score, you can effectively play a game of hot or cold if you move slowly and look out for the status indicators, or you can summon a fire elemental to walk across the path first and show up the footprints. Speaking of teleportation, many areas are guarded by indestructible sentinels who activate traps the second they see you. However, assuming you have the spell, there's nothing to stop you from teleporting them out of the way and then dumping them off in a corner somewhere. It was a long time before it even occurred to me that I'd better do this. Often solutions are tucked away in random books that might require you to read spells aloud in certain places or press switches in a certain order based on the name of the author. These switches though are used a little too often. They are quite small and if I couldn't find one I ended up zooming in and scanning my eyes over the entire environment until I found what I was after or gave myself a headache whichever came first. One of the switches represented I'd say the only time you really need to rotate the camera at all. It's tucked away in a corner that is very hard to see unless you rotate it a bit. I thought this was interesting because while you can now rotate 360 degrees, you're never expected to because the base game didn't ship with that feature and therefore none of the puzzles are designed to require that level of environmental awareness. Another feature that pops up a little too often is putting boxes on top of vents to stop poison, fire or even lightning from spreading across the floor. Most puzzles are short but sweet, and many are optional, leading to good loot and the like. However, near the end there's an epic puzzle dungeon called the Source Temple, which really puts you through your paces, and it's mandatory to get into the temple and make your way through it. I found some of these puzzles genuinely challenging, and I liked how I was forced to split my team up quite a bit, like when one person had to go off via a portal and pull a bunch of levers, so that the rest of the party could go through gates, which are also guarded by sentinels. There are some decent riddles too, and I'm a sucker for a good riddle, plus stuff like using items to put the exact amount of weight on pressure pads and noticing hidden corridors behind fake walls. I found a few puzzles frustrating due to inconsistent or illogical rule sets. Take those teleportation pyramids for example. While you can throw them over some gaps, you typically can't throw them over large obstacles or through large gaps in a wall. This feels a touch silly, but also forgivable. I mean, ideally my character would be able to throw the teleportation pyramid down into this room. However, that would make the puzzle a bit too easy. And I can understand a general reluctance to let you skip over everything by teleporting. However, not long after this bit, I was in a room where I had to stand on teleportation blocks to move from room to room. And I couldn't figure out how to progress. I just kept going around in circles. Turns out on this occasion, you could actually throw one of the teleportation pyramids through a door that only had small gaps between the iron bars. This was very much the exception to the rule, and coming so late, it was a bit annoying. 
Another slight niggle in the Source Temple is the otherwise good puzzle where you have to destroy parts of your personality to get access to books, which in turn tells you the order to light a bunch of candles. Your two main characters have personality traits, and as you play the games you can select conversation options to reflect the desired personality. For example, you can be materialistic or spiritual, bold or cautious, forgiving or vindictive, etc. When you reach the statues, you're supposed to destroy the one that doesn't reflect the part of your personality. So if you're materialistic, you should destroy the spiritual statue and vice versa. If you select the wrong one, you get booted back to the beginning of the dungeon. I had a problem here because my characters were neither materialistic nor spiritual, being balanced in the middle at this point. No matter which statue I destroyed, I always got booted back to the start of the dungeon and I couldn't make progress. Fortunately, I had a save state that wasn't too far back and I was able to change some answers in the conversation to fix this little mess. A few puzzles just didn't gel with me at all. I'm not a fan of the whole keep going through random teleporters until you happen to go in the right order style of puzzle, and a couple of secret areas can be accessed simply by lighting all the candles in the vicinity, which then means you constantly find yourself lighting every candle in Brazil you see just in case it opens a secret door. Similarly, the answer is often in books, but there are a lot of books in the game, and you don't necessarily want to pick up and read every single one. As a general rule, I also don't like it when there's a random locked door or blockage that you need to get through, and there's no information as to how or where you might get the key. Original Sin does this a few times. On balance though, the puzzles are okay. They can be a little cryptic at times, and I'm certainly glad I had a character with a high perception score to easily spot switches and hidden areas. I got stuck a few times, typically because the game didn't give me any guidance on where the solution might be found, and I naively assumed it would be close by. I prefer puzzles with a rule set that makes you think instead of just having locked doors and then keys in obscure locations. Perhaps this was another example of Larian not wanting to handhold players, but I think a little direction on where to find an answer is better than hoping players stumble upon it one day. My last issue with quest design involves the journal, and is another consequence of that attempt to remove handholding. The journal is incredibly sparse on information and is so reluctant to give you instructions that it isn't always clear how to hand in a completed quest to get credit for it. For example, one quest pitted me against what is basically a rogue mech unit that fell into the wrong hands, and while on this quest you can save some previous adventurers who tried to stop the thing. After defeating the mech I went and spoke to the quest giver, but the quest did not complete. I spoke to the man who built the mech and a few other relevant characters, including the people in charge of the local army who were pleased I'd saved one of their soldiers, but still the quest didn't resolve. I kept an eye out for the man I saved because he mentioned he was going back to Sicil, but it wasn't until hours later that I found him on guard duty in a prison. I happened to speak to him, which was lucky because he looked like any other guard, and this then triggered the end of the quest. One of the suspects in the murder of Councillor Jake is Esmeralda, his late wife. She gets her own subquest for you to prove her guilt or innocence. I solved the mystery and identified Evelyn as the guilty party, so I wanted to close off this quest. You can speak to the leader of the guard about Esmeralda, but you can't tell him she's innocent. To close the quest, you have to select the option to have the captain arrest Esmeralda, which initiates a two-way dialogue between your main protagonists, and you can agree that actually she is innocent and you won't ask the captain to arrest her. But why would you select this conversation option in the first place if you know she is innocent? You aren't going to know there's a conversation between the protagonists that will pop up afterwards. Actually, there were quite a few issues with this murder hunt. I knew Evelyn was guilty, but couldn't get much information about her from my boss, nor could I find a way into her house, which seemed to be locked up tight. To progress this quest, I had to keep pressuring Esmeralda, who eventually implicated Evelyn. This triggered Evelyn to run off and leave a key to her house behind. However, Evelyn wouldn't know Esmeralda had just grasped her up, and I had no evidence against Evelyn at this point. I was only able to get that evidence because this conversation that she didn't know about made her run away in a hurry. Also, during this investigation, I wanted to ask people for items of clothing to help uh, eliminate them from my inquiries, as I believe the saying goes. But you can't ask anyone for this, and you're expected to risk stealing it instead. Similarly, I couldn't ask to borrow an item that I could have used to entrap a different murderer. I had to try my luck at that silly rock-paper-scissors thing that the game uses to decide conversation outcomes. On other occasions, you have to go through lines of conversation that you've already been through because the new information you've gathered happens to be three options deep in a dialogue tree. You can't just say you found new information. You have to work your way back to the part of the previous conversation where that new information might be relevant. I like having the option to repeat previous conversations. It can be useful if I've forgotten something or want a story recap, but I don't want to be forced to do that all the time. There's only so many times I need my protagonists to be reminded about the god box or the void. 
especially given that I didn't much like hearing about them the first time. It's probably slightly hyperbolic to describe Divinity Original Sin's story as bad. Uninteresting is probably a more apt term. Thing is, uninteresting spread over the course of 80 hours is a big problem. I'm going to keep the story summary brief, jump to the time on screen now if you want to skip it all. The first hour or so is quite promising. You're told there used to be powerful magic in the world of Rivalon called Source. Source was originally used for good, however a long time ago it was corrupted and is now considered a force of evil. You play as two Source hunters whose job it is to hunt down those who use the Source, typically referred to as sorcerers. You're sent to Sisil to investigate the murder of Councillor Jake which looks to have been committed by a sorcerer. This is an excellent setup. First of all, it's unusual to be part of a group hunting down magic users. Fantasy games and stories more commonly pit you as the magic user who is hunted by others. A murder mystery is also a great first quest. I like playing as a detective. It gives an excuse to ask lots of questions and get the lay of the land. And where there is one murder, there is often more. So it's a natural lead into further story beats. Starting in a small town like Sicile is a common fantasy trope, but often a necessary one when there's a lot to learn. After all, I'm glad Baldur's Gate started you off in Candlekeep and not the city of Baldur's Gate. Mind you, it didn't take me 25 hours to get out of Candlekeep. From this early position of promise though, it's basically all downhill. While investigating the murder, you're magically transported to the end of time, aka Homestead, where you're told that you're not just investigating a murder, you're also trying to stop the end of the universe, which is under threat from an entity known as the Void. And of course, you aren't just two regular source hunters. You're special in some way that means you're the only people who can save the universe. Your full backstory is drip fed out over the game as you collect star stones and return them to Homestead. Essentially, you are the reincarnation of two guardians who were tasked by a god called Astarte with guarding the contaminated form of the source, which was stored in a god box. You were tricked by an entity known as the Trife into looking away from the god box for a split second, and this allowed the corrupted source to be let loose in the form of the Void. I think this moment where the guardians looked away from the god box is the original sin of the title. The guardians were stripped of their memories and sent to the real world, reborn in normal bodies. Their memories were shattered into star stones. The lofty end goal is to collect the star stones to restore your memories and help Astarte defeat the Void to save the world, galaxy, universe, whatever. The Void is working to weaken Astarte through a human known as Leandra, who in turn creates a religious group called the Immaculates and uses them to create bloodstones, while also making death knights from an element known as Tenebrium. Bloodstones are made from star stones through the sacrifice of a lesser being, such as an animal or simply another human. Leandra was the one responsible for the murder of Councillor Jake, although it was her sister Ikara who pulled the trigger, so to speak. Ikara and Leandra were part of a love triangle with a man called Xandalor. Jake was working with Leandra. At her command, he killed Xandalor, so in return, Ikara killed Jake, using the source to transfer his life essence into Xandalor to save him. Ikara and Leandra are soul bound, and Ikara believes there's still good in Leandra and wants to save her. If you like, you can let Ikara merge with Leandra before the final battle. The two souls continue to clash within her body, so half the time this conjoined entity helps you in battle, and the other half it hinders. You defeat the Void, save the universe, and get to live out the rest of your life as normal. As you can see, the story is pretty much an amalgamation of fantasy cliches that I was bored of before I could even spell the word cliché. That doesn't make the story irredeemable, of course. It simply means the story needed to excel in other ways, namely through interesting characters and good world building. Ultimately, if, as the reader, viewer, or player, you enjoy spending time with the characters, you can enjoy the journey even if the destination is boring. Even if you don't gel with the main party members, you could still enjoy a game with great world building build up through interesting NPCs. However, creating compelling characters requires good writing, and boy did the writing really rub me the wrong way a lot of the time. Original Sin has two extreme character types, the main story characters and everyone else. Every sentence from the major NPCs sounds straight out of the appendix to a high fantasy story. So many nouns and bits of in-world terminology that you need a glossary handy to follow most of it, except you likely won't care enough to bother. They're completely devoid of personality, just there to provide exposition dumps and progress the story. They even managed to make a love triangle sound dull. There are a couple of good characters though. Zigzags, the imp master of time, gets some good lines, especially when other imps show up near the end. Arthur is the one character who manages to pull off a serious story without being boring. 
he presents himself as a man who can turn into a cat but as you find out at the end he is actually a cat who can turn into a man after his owner performed magic on her pet. Near the end you can choose to turn him back into a cat or force him to stay as a human forever. The two main protagonists are a little weird, especially when playing by yourself. I assume this design decision was to account for co-op play, which was a big deal for Larry and Studios, who've been trying to nail co-op RPGs since the formation of the studio. When playing solo, you can either control both characters in conversations, which means when they are debating something, you effectively have to have conversations with yourself and even arguments. They still ended up disagreeing, I'm not sure what that says about me. This whole thing feels silly, but is probably better than the alternative, which is to have the computer make decisions you really don't like. I tried to roleplay both characters a little differently, however I found it hard to separate them in my mind beyond just doing a good cop, bad cop thing, and that seemed dull. It was a little annoying how their conversation options were only ever one of two extremes, and the outcomes were often daft. For example, I didn't think a ghost should feel obligated to forgive the ghost of the man who murdered her in anger, and this apparently made me a vindictive person. There are only four potential companions. I don't take issue with the small number. You can shape characters into whatever build type you want, so it's not like you need a character to fill every eventuality. And even if you do, there are random mercenaries you can buy to fight alongside you. The small number of companions should give us a quality over quantity situation. However, if these characters were in most other CRPGs, they would be the boring sixth party member that you've just reluctantly brought along because they have a skill you need. Even though each companion has a backstory and a quest, they never get far beyond rough sketches of personalities. Jahan is a wizard who makes it very clear from your first conversation that he won't mess about with dark magic, except he once did a deal with the devil in exchange for living to 1000 years of age. That doesn't stop him dying a lot in combat, mind you. Bear Dotter is a ranger who grew up in the wild and therefore doesn't initially know how to live among people, and Medora is another source hunter, which likely means your party of four will have three source hunters. The only companion I really liked was Wargraf, a mute rogue with a magic quill and a quest to restore his voice. With just a one-line backstory and a basic quest, the companions never feel like characters. The fact that you can buy blank slate mercenaries and not notice the difference between these characters and the handcrafted companions probably says all you need to know. Outside of the main characters you have hundreds of NPCs who are probably designed to be comic relief, except there are so many of them it works more the other way around with the serious NPCs grounding proceedings once in a while to stop things being a comical farce. I love having light-hearted stuff in otherwise serious stories, however it doesn't have the same effect when it's this constant. The animal stuff works especially well, assuming you have the pet pal trait to talk to them. Playing matchmaker to two cats is fun, as is helping out some farm animals who are about to be sold to an abattoir. I also loved getting involved with the Fabulous Five, which is basically a pyramid scheme for heroic adventurers. I liked the dim-witted and partially deaf mayor of Sicil, the articulate troll who tries to teach his son how to extract tolls from travellers, and the play you can put on to distract a crowd while you steal a skull. However, nearly every single conversation wants to get a laugh. Every character is a caricature and it becomes so damn tiresome. Overall, the characters reminded me of those in 90s point-and-click adventure games, and I say that as someone who loved those games. The thing is, those stories were supposed to be tongue-in-cheek. You were travelling through time to stop a tentacle invasion or playing as a dog and rabbit detective on the hunt for some missing circus attractions. Also, they didn't last 80 hours. Well, actually, some of them probably did for me because I didn't have internet back then and got stuck a lot. But anyway, the comedy works in those games. It doesn't work so well in a massive RPG like this. It's not comedy relief when you find yourself wanting a relief from the comedy. Similarly, the voice acting can grate a bit after a while. The voice actors were clearly told to ham it up more than Nicolas Cage in a horror movie, and while I love some hammy acting, it is again a problem when it's everyone you speak to doing it. Just in one room in Sicil, I found a terrible Sean Connery impersonator, and someone who sounds exactly like Rick Mayles' Lord Flashheart from Blackadder. Who better than a proven orc crusher to convince my dumbbell of a friend here that orcs are predators, not Pets. What do you mean, not familiar? You expect me to believe you've never heard of Alistair the Almighty? The light-hearted moments work better when they're more subtle, such as the writing on the tombs or the names of books. Even those jokes get overplayed though. I smiled the first time I saw a book about blacksmithing called He Who Smelt It, but not so much the 34th time. In addition to not caring about most of the characters, I didn't care about the wider world as a whole. 
Original Sin does technically take place in the same world as the other Divinity games, although it's set before all of them except Dragon Commander. I think Arthu is a recurring character, but I don't believe there are many references beyond easter eggs. Vinker admitted that Larian Studios didn't put much effort into wider world building until Original Sin 2, which is very apparent from playing this game. But we should have done our homework a little bit better on the world building because we would have had a lot less troubles later on in the series. And uh, we actually only started making like a, a real universe with Original Sin 2 because one of the biggest criticisms we had on Original Sin 1 was that the story was built like we made the story of Divinity 1. We just made it up on the spot without actually really thinking things through. For example, Saisu is a major port and trading hub. There's a large area in the middle that's home to a marketplace, there's a theatre space and of course a pub. It's a busy place, except there are no homes. Well, there's a couple for the major characters, but other than that, I'm not sure where everyone lives. They don't live out of town because that area is all forest and dangerous for people to travel through due to all the undead roaming around. I probably shouldn't overthink things like this, but the game made me spend a lot of time in Sicil. It was hard not to notice how artificial the place felt, especially because I've recently played The Witcher 3, which really put a lot of effort into making each and every region a believable place with proper homes and workplaces. From early on, it was hard to care about the world here because it isn't lived in. Every region was very obviously created as a location for quests, not as a place for people to live their lives. There's the town of Silverglen, which has its own mayor and is home to a lot of miners, and yet again you never see where these people live. Hunter's Edge is slightly better, but again most of the buildings are huge merchant spaces, and it's not clear who they are there to serve. The pub here is huge, but who the hell is using it? This sort of stuff isn't the be all and end all by any stretch. There's a reason I'm mentioning it near the end of the video. However, good world building is like a music soundtrack. You often don't notice it's there. It does a lot to set the mood, even if you aren't actively singing along or bouncing your foot to a beat. When it's not there or when it's really bad, you do tend to notice and then the game suffers for it. I spent 80 hours in the world of Rivalon and yet I don't feel like I know anything about it. I'm excited to play Original Sin 2 because I've heard so many good things about it, however I don't especially care about returning to this world because this game did so little in the way of world building. The only major characters I'd like to see again are maybe Zigzags and Arthu, I don't care about anyone else. And yet as much as it surprises me to say this, I did enjoy my 80 hours with Original Sin because the combat system was so much fun to play around with. If time was no issue, I would not hesitate to boot up Original Sin in Tactician difficulty and force myself to learn the intricacies of its combat systems. The synergy between your character's abilities and the environment is incredible, and the same fight can go in vastly different directions depending on your choices, and RNG of course. And just to end on a positive note, the pathfinding in Original Sin is almost impeccable. You can scroll over to the other side of the map and click on a destination safe in the knowledge that the entire party will make it there quickly and together. No more getting split up or lost, as happened in pretty much all of the older CRPGs I've played. Alright, that's it from me today. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I have a Patreon as well, where for a dollar a month you can get your name in the credits and a Patreon role in my Discord server, which is open to all. Your support is greatly appreciated. The next video in this series on isometric CRPGs will be Wasteland 2, and I'll probably cover Wasteland 1 briefly in there as well, even though that's not an isometric CRPG. The Wasteland 2 video is scheduled for October. September should bring videos on Deus Ex Invisible War and Dead Space 2. As you can tell I'm alternating between videos on isometric CRPGs, Deus Ex and Dead Space in a view to keep things interesting. Okay, until next time, cheers.